Welcome to XPISCOR, the web blog of Stephen Hall, Director General of the World Fish Center. In these blogs, Steve gives his personal reflections on current topics and areas of debate in the realm of fish and development. In this podcast of his blog, Steve talks about fish and nutrition, and not all fish are created equal. It might surprise you to learn that fish are more similar to fruit and vegetables than they are to poultry, cattle, or any of the other animals we eat. At least, they are if you think about the variety of shapes and sizes that fish and fruits and vegetables come in. As foods, though, the more important similarity is that these various types differ widely in the nutrition they offer. So as with fruits and vegetables, while admonitions to eat more fish are often heard, exactly what kind of fish you eat matters, especially if you're malnourished. But if you're poor and hungry and live in the tropics, there's a rule of thumb. Eat smaller bodied fish because they're likely to be more nutritious. That's rather fortunate given the fact that it's usually these small fish that the millions of poor living near the world's rivers and lakes and coasts actually eat. It's common in Africa and Asia, for example, to see piles of small dried fish for sale. These are added to soups and stews and provide essential nutrients that help provide the balanced diet that we all need. It's a worrying fact, though, that most of these fish are caught from the wild, and we've pretty much reach the limits of what nature can provide without help. Yet, as populations, wealth and urbanisation increase, so will the demand and need for fish. So we need to find more of them. One option, of course, is aquaculture. But right now, aquaculture grows large fish, most of which don't have the nutritional profile of their smaller counterparts. For developing countries, fish such as carps and tilapias are an important source of low-fat, high-quality animal protein and a viable and affordable alternative to meat for many poor consumers. And although eating them helps absorb nutrients from other foods, like most other meats, they do less than smaller fish to help tackle the hidden hunger of micronutrient deficiency that affects so many people. Large-bodied species are also not so well suited to the needs of the very poor. First, these people can't afford to buy large portions. Second, the distribution among the family of the flesh from a large fish often favours the adult males and male children, so women, younger children and especially girls miss out. In contrast, the small fish mixed into a stew are usually much more evenly distributed so everyone gets their share. Why not grow these smaller, more nutritious fish? Well, at local scales, that's certainly a viable option. In Bangladesh, for example, farmers in several areas are seeding their ponds with small fish to grow and reproduce naturally while feeding and growing larger fish species for sale. The smaller, more nutritious species are then used to feed local families. Expanding this idea, one can see how you might link these farmers into local supply chains to provide fish for school feeding programs or self-help groups that provide food to vulnerable people such as pregnant or lactating women. Researchers estimate that producing only 10 kilograms of small, nutrient-dense fish per year in each of the 4 million ponds in Bangladesh can meet the annual recommended vitamin A intake for over 6 million children. That's a lot. But of course, One could also consider encouraging larger scale production facilities for small fish to feed into regional trade. But the economic viability of that approach is much less certain and it needs careful analysis before any investment could be justified. Another way of fighting hidden hunger, of course, is to provide people with nutritional supplements or fortified foods. For plants, there's been considerable effort put into these approaches and some notable successes. Most of us are familiar with supplementary iodine in iodized salt, and fish powders are now being examined as a promising supplement too. You could even argue that the fish sauces that are so widespread in Asia represent an indigenous food supplement. But while supplementation has an important place in the armory, it's a never-ending business that relies on aid. In contrast, fortified crops 
such as orange flesh sweet potato, bred with enhanced levels of vitamin D, offer the prospect of systematic and systemic improvements in the nutritional content of food. For larger bodied fish species too, biofortification offers a means for overcoming the current lack of micronutrients. And because, unlike many plants, fish flesh doesn't contain anti-nutrients, chemicals that limit uptake of nutrients by humans, biofortified animal products are especially appealing. Also, achieving this is probably less technically demanding than improving crops because it can be done by manipulating the animal feeds. The adage, you are what you eat, certainly applies for fish, and enriching fish feeds to enhance the fish flesh is a very viable option. We're already seeing this with other animal products. The Omega-3 enriched egg now appears on many supermarket shelves. As with most problems, there's no single solution to the scourge of malnutrition. Instead, we need a portfolio of research to make the most of what fish have to offer. And that requires work in three areas. First, we need to work to increase the sustainable access to and consumption of the small, nutrient-dense fish for vulnerable groups. Groups like pregnant or lactating women and children. That means working out how to make the most of the fish that are available, either through direct consumption or through food supplementation products and programs, and how to grow and supply more of these fish through aquaculture. Second, we need to support the aquaculture sector to increase the availability and affordability of the larger bodied fish species, the tilapias, the carps and catfish that poor consumers can actually afford. This will help ensure the adequate high quality protein intakes that are essential for the body to develop. Finally, we need to explore options for improving the nutritional profile of these larger fish so that they make an even bigger contribution to those who eat them. If we invest in these three areas, we'll make great strides towards ensuring that fish fulfill their potential to tackle the scourge of hunger and malnutrition. And that's got to be worth the effort. Thank you for listening to the podcast for Expiscor, the web blog of Stephen Hall. If you've got any comments or feedback for Steve on this podcast, go to www.worldfishcenter.org and post them to the blog. Or email expiscor at worldfishcenter.org. Also, be sure to find us on iTunes and subscribe to this podcast.